Um, all right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, of course. Um, and tonight on the Dharma Doors, the theme or the topic that we will be discussing is non-duality. Advaita or Advaya, depends on the, the form of the word. Advaya, I think, is a little easier. A-D-V-A-Y-A, -A, Advaya. So this is everybody's favorite topic, non-duality. It's, it's a deep one. It's going to be a fun night. We're going to th think deeply about this idea. Um, so let's dive in. Uh, as usual, we're going to spend a little bit of time discussing this idea or this topic, a lot of background information to give you on this idea, and then we're going to dive back into our sutra and hear a little reading about this idea of non-duality. Um, so today's, uh, or tonight, this evening's Dharma Doors, it, it really sort of piggybacks off of last week's talk. Last week's talk was about buddhi, awakening, what would otherwise be called enlightenment. And tonight's topic is very much continuing that idea. So in other words, I'm saying that non-duality has a lot to do with awakening. <laughs> That's kind of what we're gonna get to tonight, or at least according to our sutra that we're reading, the two are going to be very much uh, synonymous in that sense. So if we can come to a good understanding of non-duality, we might come to a good understanding of awakening. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so first of all, about this idea of Advaita or Advaya, this idea of non-duality. This idea is, of course, not limited to Buddhism, and it is certainly an idea that predates Buddhism. So I will say a little bit about the idea of non-duality in general. I got to tell you, you know, I do, this will be actually my first uh, Dharma talk I've ever given on the topic of non-duality. I've, you know, it comes up, it comes up a lot but I've never actually given a Dharma talk exclusively about this. Um, and I chose from the beginning not to make this too, um, too much in that way. So I just want you to know that I'm only going to touch upon ideas of non-duality that aren't Buddhist. But there are many, 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 many. We could be here all night just talking about non-Buddhist ideas of non-duality, Let's start with this, though, just to sort of get our, our minds turning in the right way. So the idea of non-duality, as it would normally be presented in an Indian philosophical context, so the normal way, simple stuff, the normal way that we would think about the idea of non-duality, well, it's very simple, of course. <laughs> Duality is about there being two, <laughs> a duo, du duality. <laughs> hmm. So what could non-duality be? Singularity, <laughs> oneness, unity, something to that effect. It's so simple, right? If duality is about there being two, well, then non-duality is about there being one, right? And indeed, that sort of is the way that non-duality sort of was first taught. And again, I'm not even talking about Buddhism yet. I'm just talking about a general Indian context in which what is non-duality? oneness. And so in the early, again, Indian philosophical context, 
what they were seemingly talking about, and I am, by the way, if you know your, your philosophy, if you know your history, I am talking about what would be called Vedanta, kind of late Upanishadic uh, period Indian philosophy called Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, this general idea. But the basic idea of, of Advaita Vedanta, and I'm speaking very generally now, the general idea is that there is a, an illusion. It might be called Maya, the illusion. And the illusion is that there are two. Call it subject, object, call it me and you, call it here and there, but that this realm that we find ourselves in is Maya is an illusion and that actually sort of underneath everything there is a unity or a, a oneness to everything and traditionally the way that this would be talked about is in terms of brahma brahma is like you know you could call it the divine you know, the ultimate God, if you want to get into that kind of talk. But the idea is, is that the, the reality, the truth, <laughs> is that there's this oneness or this unity, Brahma, and the confusion or the delusion is that there's a, that there is a duality when there's really not, there's this unity. So that's all well and good. And that does turn into entire philosophical traditions, even some religious traditions in a way. But here's the thing about it. Here's the, here's the problem with that definition of non-duality. This, this, uh, this idea of, of oneness, it seems very relative and contrasted to this whole Maya delusion idea. That sounds very dualistic to posit a unity. Huh, wait a minute. It seems so simple when I started a few moments ago. Oneness. And indeed, that is sort of one of the problems with Advaita Vedanta, is that if you really start analyzing it, it seems to remain still very dualistic in the sense that it's pointing at this like truth of non-duality. <laughs> don't, don't worry about this over here. <laughs> We're over here. And again, that seems kind of dualistic. So that all of a sudden puts us in a very different mode of thinking where we're not gonna get off that easy. <laughs> Just being like, oh, oneness, got it. Mm -mm. So I, I'm not, again, I am not gonna go deep into how we got there or how we get here, but tonight and for the rest of the night, I'm only going to be talking about non-duality within a Buddhist context that in many ways is trying to deal with that problem. And that problem is that even if we say non-dual, <laughs> we're still stuck in this idea of dual and non-dual. It's so wild that even the idea of non-duality doesn't get us out of duality. In fact, it keeps us kind of still in that. So how would we, wow, well, wait, what is it then? What is this non-duality and how could we possibly in a way conceive of it, attain it, or any of these ideas? Well, that is exactly what the sutra that we're reading tonight, or that I'm going to read a little bit from, that's exactly what it's trying to get at. Not only is it 
trying and uh, in my opinion succeeding in in moving us towards non-duality but it's actually going to deal with this very problem that i introduced which is that really any anything you posit even if it's this profound idea of non-duality you're going to realize very quickly wait a minute that still creates a duality how, how do we actually really find this non-duality in that sense? Okay, so in order to find out the Buddhist answer to this conundrum, we're going to be hearing from the wise Bodhisattva Manjushri, right? That is the sutra that we've been reading is a sutra that's kind of about this particular Bodhisattva named Manjushri. And I want to, for all the Dharma heads, for all the real uh, Dharma students out there, I want to sort of remind you of something. So probably the best place to go to understand the Buddhist idea of non-duality, I would probably recommend the Vimalakirti Sutra and Particularly, you would want to refer to chapter nine of the Vimalakirti Sutra, which is called Entering the Dharma Door of Non-Duality. Entering the Advaita Dharma Prayaya. Entering this non-dual Dharma Door. So the first thing that's cool about chapter nine is that it uses this term Dharma Door. And that's what I call these Sunday night talks, the Dharma doors. So a Dharma door is a teaching. It's sometimes synonymous with a sutra, but a Dharma door is usually understood as a, like a gateway to awakening or a teaching that leads to awakening in that way. And so this is the chapter that's on the Dharma door of non-duality. And if you've read the Vimalakirti Sutra, you know, you, you know this chapter, this is such a, uh, an important chapter, but I'm gonna just break it down for you really quickly. What happens in chapter nine is that the, the star of the sutra, a householder named Vimalakirti, he asks a group of bodhisattvas, how did you all enter the Dharma door of non-duality? Like, how did each of you figure out non-duality? And they, uh, I think it's about maybe about 30 or so of these bodhisattvas, they each give a, you know, one or two lines. They're very short, but it's a one or two line answer to how they all came to this understanding of non-duality. And they all, all of the Bodhisattva's answers begin with, or, and actually they're all structured the same way, where it's like um, well, one of them, I think it's the second of the Bodhisattvas says, I and mine make two or create a duality. And then the Bodhisattva explains how they found a way, a Dharma door, in between those two of I and mine. And each of the Bodhisattvas goes presenting their ideas. And it's a really beautiful chapter, I have to tell you. It's like, it's, it's hard to explain without actually just getting into that chapter, but it's sort of about how each of the bodhisattvas, once they kind of make their claim, it sort of leaves open that, that problem that I just mentioned. And so the next bodhisattva sort of picks up where the other one left off and sort of deals with that paradox or that duality that sort of is left over from the prior bodhisattva. And this sort of game 
goes all the way to the end of the chapter where wouldn't you know it, it's Bodhisattva Manjushri who kind of gives the, the concluding answer to this problem. Now, the Malakirti, the star of this sutra, is actually the last person to, well, that's the thing about it. When Vimalakirti is finally asked, but how do, how do you enter the Dharma door of non-duality? Vimalakirti remains silent. And everybody applauds and says, excellent, excellent. Truly the perfect answer in that way. Now, barring me just being silent for the next hour and, and kind of giving you that presentation of non-duality, we're going to back up one and talk about Manjushri. So the idea here is kind of all I really wanted to mention was that in that chapter and really in the entire, in the entire Vimalakirti Sutra, Manjushri is the Bodhisattva of non-duality. Like this Bodhisattva Manjushri represents this idea of non-duality. Like, and I think many of you probably know, because I, I say this often, but you know, when, 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 when I read these Mahayana Buddhist sutras on Sunday nights, I like to point out that, you know, for me, all of these characters, all of these bodhisattvas, you know, they're all allegorical figures. I don't, I don't read these sutras as historical documents in that way, where there, there was a person named Manjushri who at that time did something. I read these much more as allegory in that sense. And so allegorically speaking, Manjushri is and represents this idea of non-duality in a really, really kind of deep way. So interesting that in the sutra we're reading, in the Dharma doors here, which is Manjushri's, uh, for short, you can just call it Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra. It's about Manjushri's enlightenment. Like that Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva of non-dual wisdom, becoming a Buddha. <laughs> and in that, in that context, I want to just quickly remind you from last week of how the reading went. So there's another bodhisattva named uh, Lion Courage Thundering Voice or something like that. And this is a bodhisattva we've never heard of really before. He's in this sutra, but again, probably better to read it as an allegorical figure. And this bodhisattva Lion Courage asks, well, actually, this is what's really funny. This bodhisattva rises up out of the crowd and asks the Buddha, asks the Buddha, so how long until Manjushri attains Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, which, as we discussed last week, is this idea of complete awakening. So the bodhisattva asks this Pretty simple question. <laughs> When's Manjushri going to become a Buddha, become fully enlightened? So right now, right away, I already want you to be thinking this way. This isn't about the Buddha and the Bodhisattva and all of that. If we keep in mind that Manjushri is non-duality, then this question about, so when does the, when does the non-dual achieve awakening is, is kind of like, whoa, <laughs> that's a really wild idea. So I want you to be thinking about that as I kind of move through this. So the first thing that's very funny about this sutra is the Buddha says to Lion Courage, why don't you ask him yourself? And that right there is actually kind of funny because 
if you again if you understand the bodhisattva is allegorical when the bodhisattva asks the buddha hey when's manju shri going to get enlightened we have this uh, again i mentioned it last week it's not even a duality it's like a triality i don't even know what word you would use for that but you have like multiple and so the initial the first thing the buddha says is why don't you ask him yourself and that's an interesting way of for the buddha to sort of pull this akido this dharma akido and be like why don't you go face to face with non-duality and ask non-duality yourself so the bodhisattva does and then lion courage asks manjushri so when will you attain awakening and that's when manjushri starts to give this bodhisattva a hard time <laughs> and the first thing he says is why are you asking me about when i'm going to attain awakening why don't you ask something more like am i moving towards awakening but then he says, but even if you asked me that, I don't even move towards awakening. So how could I ever attain awakening? And this is where Manjushri is causing the reader confusion. <laughs> it's like, whoa, wait a minute, what are they talking about? And even the Bodhisattva is like, whoa, 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 wait a minute haven't you made the vow aren't you progressing towards full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings and that's when manjushri says well if sentient beings existed in reality sure then i would progress towards awakening for their benefit but since there are no sentient beings in reality i'm not progressing towards anything but then the bodhisattva is still confused by this and says but no but wait okay but then you're moving like towards all buddha dharma is basically what he says now last week i mentioned it very very quickly this idea that there's no such thing as sentient beings in reality so that, of course, is an essential teaching to the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, also a sutra very closely associated with Manjushri, by the way. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go through that whole teaching because it's actually not super, I actually, I have reasons to leave you hanging. I want to leave you hanging in that sense. But the teaching is actually pretty severe. It's pretty serious. Not only does Manjushri, quoting the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, not only does he say there's no such thing in reality as a sentient being, he says there's no such thing as life. There's no such thing as an individuality or a personality. And these, again, are all essential teachings to the Vajra Sutra. I mentioned or I gave a teaching on it quickly last week. But now I want to pick up where we left off last week. And don't worry, we're going to discuss everything I've just talked about. But where we left off last week, and I think, yeah. So what happened at the end of last week was Manjushri said all of this. He said all this stuff about there not really being sentient beings, about there not really being such a thing as life. And then made this statement about, so I'm not moving towards enlightenment. I'm not moving towards awakening in that sense. Then our original bodhisattva, Lion Courage, says, let's see. He says, Manjushri. A bodhisattva like you has great influence 
over other bodhisattvas. If you say, I don't aspire to awakening, nor will I fully awaken to Buddhahood, beginner bodhisattvas will become afraid when they hear this. So we did talk about this last time, but it was towards the end and I wanted to kind of start there. So the idea is, is that if, if you hear that teaching, that in reality, there is no such thing as a sentient being or even life. If you hear that and are a little concerned, like that maybe that sounds a little, again, a little severe or a little harsh or wait a minute. And if you're following the logic and Manjushri saying, yeah, so I, I don't seek awakening, yeah, there's no, no, there's really no such thing as awakening in that sense. The a, a bodhisattva who first has started out might be worried. Well, then what am I doing here? What's wait a minute? So, the bodhisattva lion courage is sort of speaking on our behalf, provided that we maybe have that reaction to that teaching. So, I want you to recognize right away. The sutra understands that this is a radical teaching. It doesn't expect this to just be like, oh, of course, there's no such thing as sentient beings. It's like this is potentially alarming information in that sense. So Manjushri's answer to this whole idea about bodhisattvas becoming fearful when they hear this, he says, noble one. All dharmas, all phenomena are beyond fear. For in reality, there is no fear. The Buddha, the Tathagata, teaches the dharma so that there will be no fear. Someone who is frightened will grow disenchanted. Those who are disenchanted will be freed from attachment, and those who are free from attachment will be liberated. So I, I read this last week. I read a different translation last week. I'm reading a, a new translation, but it's the same ideas, of course. And I didn't really have time last week to go through this, but I wanted to just notice a few things. Manjushri is pulling some really interesting logic in this chapter where he's saying, oh yeah, if somebody hears this and they become fearful, <laughs> basically that's good in a way. And it's like, good, wait, how's that? Well, because if someone is, it grows fearful, they'll, in the translation I read last week, it says that they will become like have disgust in that sense, or they won't want in that way. This one is about they will become disenchanted. And those who are disenchanted will be freed from attachment. And those who are free from attachment will be liberated. Whoa, how did we get from being afraid to being liberated? That's an interesting twist there. So we're going to learn more about this, about this transformation of fear to liberation. So he says, and of course, those who are liberated are without fetters. And those who have eliminated all fetters will be freed from all desire. Those who are free from desire do not go. And those who do not go do not come. Those who do not come do not aspire. So let me back up. I'll, tr I'll try without spending too long on every single word. <laughs> so he's walking through this idea without attachments, there's no desire. If you know your Four Noble Truths, you know desire is kind of a big problem <laughs> when it comes to dukkha or suffering. So again, Manjushri is walking us through this interesting thing where we then 
have no fetters because we have no attachments, no fetters, no desire. Those who are free from desire don't go. And those who don't go don't come. So that's some technical Buddhist speech that I want to introduce tonight. So the idea of going, it, you could think about this a lot of different ways. You could think about it as simple as going to the store. <laughs> Those without desire do not go. But that's not exactly what they mean by go. When they're talking about going, they're talking about going away and like dying. Yeah, to be reborn, which is what they mean by come, arrive in that way. So this is sort of the beginning of our dive into non-duality. And so rather than just throwing out these words and ideas like non-dual, oneness, <laughs> Rather than just throwing out words, this text, this little chapter that I'm going to read tonight, is going to walk us towards this non-duality. So it begins by this deconstruction of all of these ideas. And so to say, those without desire, sorry, let me get the language just right, those who are free from desire do not go. And this, of course, is classic Buddhist dharma, which is the idea that if you have actually cut off all desire, you do not go. Meaning you don't, it gets tricky, but the idea is you don't, you don't die in that sense. Go, as in go away, and again, when they're talking about going, there's this implied understanding that they're talking about the samsaric cycle of then returning. So going and coming back again. But if you don't go, you do not come. You do not come back. You do not arrive. So that which doesn't go doesn't come in that sense. And then it says, those who do not come, do not aspire. And then that's a very wild idea. Let me just drop this on you. So that the, the being that was never born, a, a creature, a person, whatever, that never comes into existence, is never born. What do they want to be when they grow up? Doesn't make any sense. They have not come into being. That which doesn't come does not aspire, said the text. Yeah. Those who do not form aspirations do not regress. And those who do not regress turn away. What do they turn away from? They turn away from clinging to self. They turn away from clinging to sentient beings. They turn away from clinging to life. And they turn away from clinging to personality. They turn away from clinging to nihilism. They turn away from clinging to eternalism. They turn away from clinging to all characteristics. They turn away from all concepts. And as they turn away, they become unchangeably non-regressing. Non-regressing from what? Non-regressing from emptiness? Non-regressing from signlessness or characteristiclessness? 
and non-regressing from wishlessness or aimlessness. So let's talk about those. So the language of non-regressing and regressing, it's very Buddhist language. It's kind of about backsliding in that sense. I spoke about it, I think, a few Sundays ago. But it's the idea of regressing is like if you've made a vow, like, you know, let's say you've decided to be vegan. You said, you know what? I don't want to be violent in that way anymore. I'm not going to um, consume animal products. That's the vow. If, if you've made that vow, that would be a vow. And then maybe something comes up and you, you wind up eating meat again. Well, that's called regressing. In a Buddhist context, that would be called regressing in that way. And regressing, and especially if I use the term backsliding, regressing is usually not a good thing. It's, the idea is, is that if you are a non-regressing bodhisattva, that's a good thing. And if you're regressing, that's not considered a great thing. Manjushri has again done a little twist where he's made regressing a good thing, sort of. When he said, and that's why it's like regressing from what? Well, regressing from attachment to the self, regressing from attachment to sentient beings, life, personality. And in the process of regressing from those things, the bodhisattva becomes non-regressing. And then what do they become non-regressing from? From signlessness, characteristiclessness, and wishlessness. And a bunch of other things too, by the way, but I'm just going to start with those three. So these three, emptiness, what is usually called signlessness, and what is usually called wishlessness, these are a really good starting point for thinking about the Buddhist idea of non-duality. So the Buddhists are not going to talk about oneness. They're not going to talk about unity. They're going to talk about all of that. What they're going to talk about is emptiness. That's going to be a Buddhist sort of way of thinking about this idea of non-duality. So, um, you know, I do talks about emptiness most Sunday nights, so I'm not going to go deep into that idea. Um, in general, though, I do want to talk about these three ideas together because they are usually called, well, they are actually also called Dharma doors. These are three Dharma doors, and these are the three Dharma doors of liberation, in the, as they would be called, the three doors of liberation. They always go together, emptiness, signlessness and wishlessness. Let me give you the Sanskrit in case you're already familiar with these. So shunyata, shunyata, that's emptiness, right? Characteristiclessness has two names, but the normal one would be um, alakshana. It's sometimes also called animita. Nimitas and lakshanas are kind of the same, but this is a nimita, a lakshana, no lakshana, no characteristics. The third is called apranihita. I'll talk about that one in a second, but let's deal with the first two really quickly. So, you know, the idea of emptiness is always a tricky one. It's really, you know, it's about what the Buddhists call the svabhava, the essence, the essential nature of something. And emptiness is about things not having an essential nature, like not having a fixed essential nature. And let's, let's just do this one really quickly. This is one of my, you know, one of my random props to make empty. So I'm going to emptyify this for you. So the idea here is, is that you may have a notion 
of what that is. And that, that, the notion, the idea that you have of what this is, that's what we're talking about as being empty. And what I mean by that is, is that you might think, you might call this a roll of toilet paper. And we need to give a little bit of thought about what a roll of toilet paper is. So what I mean is, is that if I, if I hold this up and I show it to you, you probably, I'm guessing, have an idea of what this is used for. You probably have an idea of where in your house you would most likely find said object. <laughs> you probably have a lot of different ideas that are kind of wrapped up in the roll of toilet paper. And what I want you to start thinking about is how if we could find somebody, you know, we go down to, the, to South America, down to the Amazon, and we find somebody who's never used a quote, modern toilet, who has used water, just water, <laughs> their whole life to clean up after themselves after they defecate. If we took that person and showed them this, are they gonna see a roll of toilet paper? The idea here is, is that we need to start disambiguating and separating what we are projecting onto phenomena versus what's actually there. And the idea is, is that a toilet paper isn't out here. A roll of toilet paper is only, quote, in the mind of somebody who is conditioned to see cylindrical, white, cylindrical <laughs> things and be like, oh, that's a roll of toilet paper. But that roll of toilet paper is only in the, the mind of the beholder in that sense. And what I want you to now, if, if you have successfully done that, if you can successfully separate out the roll of toilet paper, which is a concept, which is an idea, you need to be conditioned, you need to be taught. In fact, we are toilet trained for, uh, for months because we don't, we don't know that this is what that is. We have to be taught that that's what this is in that sense. So if you have successfully put the roll of toilet paper sort of as a condition of the mind, what's that then? And what I mean by that is this, if we really have put the roll of toilet paper over there, I'm not so sure that we can keep talking about this as one thing. And what I mean is, is that we all know that there's this, uh, you know, the cardboard cylinder in here, and then there's, there's this, and it's only in the realm of a roll of toilet paper that those two things get to be one thing. If we put this, the toilet paper over here, we can't keep speaking singularly, like it. What is it? I don't know what it is. If the, if the roll of toilet paper is over here, and right there is the emptiness which is that there isn't one thing here. Although it might appear to be, and that one thing you probably would call a roll of toilet paper. So that points to the emptiness of this phenomena, 
But what I just said is true of all phenomena, which is that what we think they are is kind of a projection in that sense. And if we were really, really, really to separate out that projection, I don't know how many. I don't, I wouldn't even know where to start counting. Like, you know, that's, is this, is this one? If this is one, how many, right? I don't know how many. <laughs> so my point is, is that the first thing we do is we go, oh, emptiness. The next of these is that idea of no lakshana, no characteristics. And, you know, the idea, of course, of characteristics is how did you even think it was a roll of toilet paper to begin with? Could it be its color? Could it be its size? Definitely the shape. So shape, size, color, number, all of those are characteristics. Characteristics of what? Don't say a roll of toilet paper. You can't say a roll of toilet paper because remember that's over here. So what color is it? Oh wait, it doesn't exist because there isn't one thing in that way. So everybody follow me on emptiness. And if, if it's empty, then characteristics, what characteristics? And then the third of these, the third of these is a very, very interesting one. So again, it's called apranihita, uh, A-P-R-A-N-I-H-I-T-I, -I, something to that effect, apranihita. It's usually translated as wishlessness. Sometimes you'll see aimlessness. It's a really tricky word, Sanskrit word to translate, but I wanna give you a taste of it. it I pref it, it's, not a per it's not a perfect translation of apranihita, but I think it gets more to the point of what that idea is. I translate it as purposelessness. And what it is, is, is that you might think that this has a use, a, 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 like a, 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 a raison d'etre, a reason for being. And the idea here is, is that if you think that this is used for something, that's the, that's what we're talking about. And the idea is, is that the gateway, the third door of liberation, which is the, the purposelessness of things. It's about recognizing that any purpose is also projected based upon what we think it is. And why do we think what it is is what it is? Because of the characteristics. So the reason why these three doors of liberation are always taught together is because those three ideas are bound up in what we think of as the existence of things, that they are, that they have characteristics, and that they have a reason for being. Another, you know, it's one of a, the way that this can become a practice, by the way, the, the Vietnamese teacher Thich Nhat Hanh would often do a, um, a pranihita meditation. And the way that Thich Nhat Hanh would do meditations on, on this idea of wishlessness, aimlessness, or purposelessness, he would do these walking meditations where you basically don't try to walk towards anything or you know, to have any purpose. We would call it wandering in that sense, 
But what the practice was, was about noticing intentionality in that sense and needing things to go a certain way. This, by, by the way, this is another way to practice apranihita in the midst of chaos, when you cannot control things. This is a beautiful practice to let go of that desire for things to go this way or that way. You know, sometimes we can get very obsessive about trying to push reality in certain directions that where we would wish it to go, where we would aim it to go. And that the practice of a pranihita is about kind of being fine with things going how they go in that sense. So they're all three bound up together. Yeah, Tanya. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because as soon as you said before, you, when you said wishlessness, it made me think of that and made me think of, I think it's um, Upeksha, sure, like sure. equanimity, just like, because if you're not, if you don't have any sort of aim, you don't, you're not grasping for something, you're just chill, right? Like, Excellent. and it's so, so there's no grasping and there's no emotional, you know, there's no, it's just a chill, emotional kind of state kind of thing. I would agree. I believe that that is absolutely what we're talking about. And by the way, that upeksha, that equanimity that you speak of, is really at the heart of emptiness. It's really at the heart of characteristiclessness. And it's really at the heart of the third, apranihita, the wishlessness, for sure. Okay. Any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? Yeah, Jenny. I've taken so many notes. Let me see if I can do this. But I think the short story is in a non-dual way of being, then there is no time. There is nothing in which we're comparing to, no place we have to be, that we just are in the space. we don't have fear because there's nothing to fear because we just live here. Excellent, exactly, exactly. The, thank you for bringing us back to non-duality, the fearlessness, exactly, exactly. In fact, Jenny, you're a few paragraphs ahead of the game. Yeah, you, you. When you, does that ever happen? <laughs> <laughs> so, everybody good with where we're at? Okay, so because of Jenny's question, I am going to jump to uh, pretty quickly ahead because I want to uh, seize the moment of her great question. So, um, within this signless or emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness. Manjushri says that right in there, right in there are all Buddha Dharma, all the qualities of a Buddha, basically Buddhahood. Buddhahood is right in there. What are the qualities of Buddhahood, you may ask? Uh, the qualities of Buddhahood are indivisible, Manjushri tells us. Indivisibility is very much what Jenny was kind of getting at, but that idea of indiv indivisible. You can't separate the qualities of Buddhahood into two. The qualities of Buddhahood are beyond categorization. The qualities of Buddhahood are unobservable. The qualities of Buddhahood are unadoptable. The qualities of Buddhahood are unrejectable. The qualities of Buddhahood are unmoving, unknowable, merely names, empty, unborn, unceasing, beyond coming, beyond going, immaculate unstained, not possessive, beyond all mental engagement, non-defiling, ungraspable, 
and beyond being equaled or unequaled. So I would love to dive just into that, but I really want to get us to the next. So basically, Manjushri just told us that Buddhahood is inconceivable, beyond categorization, beyond compare, unequal. Then he says to the Bodhisattva lion courage, the qualities of Buddhahood are neither Dharma nor not Dharma. So let's pause there because that's kind of where I kind of wanted to make a, a, a clearer statement about Buddhist non-duality. So the way that Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism, the way that Buddhism gets around that problem of oneness versus duality, and therefore we're still in a duality, the way Buddhism gets through that is actually th through a particular um, twist of grammar. <laughs> and the twist of grammar is the neither nor. It's seemingly simple, but it's a profound twist of grammar that has allowed and allows for Buddhism to say a lot of very profound things. So in other words, neither dual nor singular. Now we're looking at it in that sense. Neither nor. Now, what Manjushri has just said is that the qualities of Buddhahood are neither Dharma nor not Dharma. Now, there's so many different ways to understand that. First of all, of course, there's that problem of the word Dharma. <laughs> Most of my students know this because I make a big deal about it, but the word Dharma, you know, of course, is so tricky. It's such a tricky word within the world of Buddhism because the word Dharma has this broad spectrum of meaning, and it can mean everything from the ultimate truth of reality, like something is Dharma, it is law, like capital L, the law, the truth, the principle, it's Dharma, all the way down to anything and everything you could possibly think of is a dharma. And that's where the word dharma becomes synonymous with anything, any dharma, any phenomena. Oh, look, it's a bird, the dharma of a bird, a flower, the dharma of a flower, uh, an emotion, the dharma of that emotion, everything. So to say that the qualities of Buddhahood are neither Dharma nor not Dharma, you could be saying it's neither a thing nor not a thing, neither a phenomena nor not a phenomena. Or you could be saying Buddha Dharma is neither Buddha Dharma, is neither the truth nor not the truth. That's, yeah, Jenny, she got it. Can also be everything? No, because that's going to put us back in that, the, the problem, the duality problem. The idea is, is that the idea of everything is still going to be related to something over here call it nothing, everything and nothing, um, everything, and then all the individual things. So we're looking for a conceptual way out of actually thinking dualistically, like actually not leaving any possible room for duality. And so to say that Buddhahood is neither something nor not something, If you really are there, 
you basically just start to slip into a meditative state where you're like, whoa, okay, not a thing, but not not a thing. Yeah, Jimmy. <laughs> You good, Jenny? Yeah, she's good. Okay, <laughs> I thought you had a question. Okay, so let's keep going in this paragraph because it's going to keep going. So the qualities of Buddhahood are neither Dharma nor not Dharma. And why is this? Manjushri asks rhetorically. Because in Dharmas, or in the qualities of Buddhahood, I should say, there is no observable locus of something that could be called the qualities of Buddhahood. Noble one, those beginner bodhisattvas who become afraid as they hear this teaching, they will swiftly and fully awaken to Anuttara Samyak Sambuddhi. Those who do not become afraid will in no way fully awaken to Buddhahood. Lion Courage. Lion Courage says, Manjushri, what do you mean? <laughs> Literally, what do you mean? Oh, wait, what did he, he just said those who don't become afraid will not become awakened. How's that? Manjushri answers, noble one. Those who become afraid will worry and generate this thought. I should fully awaken to Buddhahood. They will fully awaken to Buddhahood to, de to the degree that they arouse the mind set on full awakening. Those who do not arouse this intention, they don't aim to become awakened, but they become unconcerned with it and not focused on the mindset towards awakening. Thus, they don't think any further about it. When there's no further reflection, there will also be no full awakening. Why is there no full awakening? Because they don't aim to become awakened. That's why there's no full awakening to Buddhahood. Noble one, he says, tell me, can space fully awaken? <laughs> all right I'll, I'll hold off on the answer to that question so that's where manjushri kind of finally concludes his interesting logic about fear and you know he began this whole thing with bodhisattvas or the question was well what if people hear this and they become afraid and manjushri says this weird thing which is like yeah only the people that become afraid will become fully awakened. And those who aren't afraid will not. But then he does this interesting form where he says, well, if you're not afraid by this, then you don't care. And if you don't care in that sense to generate awakening, then you're not going to get fully awakened. And this is important. And actually, I'm going to... Yeah, let me read you from an alternate translation. I want you to hear how complicated this can really get. So the alternate translation reads more like this. Noble one, uh, the qualities of Buddhahood are neither Dharma nor not Dharma. So that's the same. And why? Because the Buddha Dharma arises from nowhere. If a novice bodhisattva hears this statement and becomes frightened, they will eventually attain enlightenment. 
Observing this, one may think, I must first bring forth bodhicitta and abide in deep realization. Then I can attain Buddhahood. Otherwise, if I do not generate bodhicitta, I can never attain Buddhahood. However, Manjushri says, actually, one shouldn't even harbor that kind of discrimination because both bodhicitta and Buddhahood are inapprehensible. If they are inapprehensible, how could they be observed? If they can't be observed, realization will not be possible. Why will realization not be possible? Because without observation, realization will have no germinating cause. So this might sound, I, you know, I'm not quite sure how this is sounding right now. So this is actually a really important point that, let's see, yeah, because of the time, I'm just going to try to explain it in that sense, like simply and clearly. Try, I'll do my best. So what we're kind of up against here is a sort of, an, you know, it's sort of about, mm, it's so hard. This stuff is very difficult to articulate. It's so when it's about this idea of Buddhist ideas of non duality, neither nor, neither dualistic nor singular, neither nor. So when it comes to that, a very important thing arises. And what it is, is, is that, well, actually, let's go back to my opening remarks about uh, Advaita, about non-duality traditionally. And I mentioned that traditionally, non-duality is about that duality, hi, you know, subject object is confusion, is maya, is the illusion. And there's this reality, like the real, real, Brahma, or what, what have you. And so the idea here is, is that within that way of thinking about non-duality, this is not non-duality. Non-duality is, I don't know, it's like over there, it's like not, it's not this. And where the Buddhists, especially Manjushri right here, what he's getting at is, well, it's not this, but it's not not this. And, the, and, and this is where Je Jenny already, Jenny said this, by the way, this is what I meant earlier, that Jenny was one paragraph ahead of us. The idea is, is that non-duality or this Advaita, or what have you, it's, it's nowhere, it's nowhere but here. It, it, it can't be. And that's why, Jenny, when you said it's everything, it's like, yeah, but we still want to avoid, you know, these particular ideas, whether it's, you know, oneness or everything, you know, it's like they're always going to be just this idea next to some other ideas. So to say, well, non-duality, it's not this, but it's not not this. And what that second part does, when, it, when we say that it's not not this, it invites us, let's say, it invites us to take a much closer look at this, not to seek enlightenment or non-duality, not to seek these things anywhere else, but right here. And of course, that's always true, meaning it's not just the specialness of Dharma doors on Sunday nights. 
It's not just the specialists of SFDC, but the idea is, is that it will always be right there in that sense, but depending on certain things, it, we're either kind of in a dualistic mode or non-dualistic mode, so to speak. Right. Everybody feeling okay about that? Kind of, I'm try, I was trying to input in my own words, this very complicated paragraph about, about not seeking or seeking awakening in that sense. And this idea that if there's no seeking for it, meaning that there's no interest in it, then there's a way that this awakening can't come about in that sense. So this is an important part of a lot of sutras, by the way. It, it, what it is, is it really addresses a kind of like, how can I put it? It addresses a kind of blase, everything is everything attitude. This, this kind of hi almost hippie idea of like, well, everything is everything. And it's, it's not that easy in that way to just say, you know, everything is everything. Because we can say these things, but to really get at them is very different in that sense. Really quickly, let me just finish up this little, um, we're very close to where I wanted to get tonight. So let me just finish this section. So after this, this pointing at how non-duality isn't this, but it's not not this. After that, Manjushri asks the Bodhisattva, what do you think? Can Akasha, space, awaken to Buddhahood? Can space become awakened? Bodhisattva Lion Courage responds by saying, it cannot, Manjushri. Manjushri continues, noble one, nevertheless, doesn't the Blessed One, the Buddha, teach that all dharmas are equal to space? The Bodhisattva responded, it's true, Manjushri. That's what the Buddha teaches. Manjushri continued, noble one, in that case, awakening is just like space, and space is just like awakening. Space and awakening are not two. They cannot be differentiated. Who, whoever understands this sameness knows no small thing. There is nothing such a person doesn't know. And by the way, when this teaching was given, 12,000 monks liberated their minds from defilement without any further grasping, and 14,000 gods purified their dharma eyes, which sees all phenomena free from dust and equal, and 96,000 beings Arouse their mind for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. And 52,000 bodhisattvas gained the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena. Okay, so that's where I wanted to get to. Let's back it up. So let's just deal, yeah, especially because we're getting a little late on time. Let's just deal with what Manjushri said regarding, did, didn't the Buddha teach that all phenomena are like empty space, are like akasha? To which the Bodhisattva says, yeah, that's what the Buddha teaches. So I'm glad I showed you the emptiness of the roll of toilet paper 
because the emptiness of phenomena is what they're talking about. The space-like empty nature of all phenomena. That's what the Buddha teaches. That's what Manjushri asked. But doesn't the Buddha teach that all dharmas are like empty space? So, you know, this is a, 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 um, uh, an important point to make. So this word akasha, space, we talk about space and uh, dharma doors a lot. It's a really important part of the dharma. Um, if you were here last week, Manjushri walked the bodhisattva, lion courage, through a kind of contemplation. And the contemplation that Manjushri um, walked the bodhisattva through was, it was the question, does form seek enlightenment? And when he said form, he meant rupa, like physicality, physical body. And also he asks, well, how about sensations? How about perception? How about our conditioning? How about consciousness? Do those seek enlightenment? Now, those, those five, of course, are the five skandhas, the five aggregates. It's the essential teaching of all forms of Buddhism that there is no self, there are the five aggregates. There's a body of form, ever-changing, firing with sensations that are always changing, perceiving things that are always changing, being conditioned and always changing in the way that we are conditioned in that sense. And then, of course, what we are conscious of moment to moment to moment is always changing. So there's never any there there. There's the five aggregates. So there's the teaching of no self. And what Manjushri did in this sutra, it was really interesting, is he, he said, and how about form? Does that seek enlightenment? And the Bodhisattva said, of course not. In inert, that's like asking, do, do, do the atoms seek awakening? Do atoms seek enlightenment? The last time I checked, atoms and molecules do not seek enlightenment. That's basically what the Bodhisattva said. How about the sensations? How are that with the perception? And in the end, there was nothing left to seek <laughs> enlightenment in that sense. All of that, form and sensation, perception, conditioning, consciousness, those are all phenomena with form, if you will. And I don't mean materiality, but I mean that they have qualities, they have characteristics in that sense. They are definable. Space, akasha, is, uh, is something else entirely. And again, I kind of talk a lot about space. You know, space is this profound dimension to our reality here, where space is the, is the in-between of things. The reason why you can see two hands is because there's space here. The reason why you probably think there's space between me and back here, or space between the bird and the tree. If there were no space between the bird and the flower, they would, they would be in the same place, the same space, and you would not be able to differentiate them. How about my fingers? Oh, you need the space. Well, how about the palm of my hand? There's no space. Oh, look. My point is, is that the mind, mind, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, uses, relies on space to make sense of form. 
but space is not an element. It's not a substance. It's not a substrate. It's not the ether because space just keeps multiply. Like there's infinite amounts of it. It just, it, it just really depends on, oh, look, my two eyes. So now there's space. <laughs> oh, how much space is here? It's almost as if there's an infinite amount of space and it just depends upon where my mind stops. So space is this really profound idea that it's, it's kind of about vacuum, like just the space. Well, you will often hear in sutras, the Buddha saying things like, well, like all phenomena are like space. Now, what's wild about that teaching of the Buddha, that all phenomena are like space? Well, I just got done telling you that you can conceive of two hands because of the space. But the teaching of the Buddha that Manjushri just mentioned was that phenomena are like space. Not space is, of course, like space, right? That's just pure tautology. Space is space. But to say that all phenomena are like space, that's kind of a different thing. But you can grok, you can understand how it is that all phenomena are like empty space if you understand the emptiness of phenomena. And so what I wanted to do right there, and I, maybe I did it, maybe I didn't, but I wanted to kind of show the, the parity between space and emptiness. They are not the same idea, but they are very related, but they're not the same idea. And to speak about the emptiness of things is about to think, is to speak about the space-like nature of all reified or conceptualized phenomena. And it's space-like because it ain't out here. <laughs> it ain't nowhere. And by the way, ain't, ain't nowhere, my, my wonderful grammar. I believe the Buddha said, or Manjushri said about ain't nowhere. Um, Manjushri said, it's about having no observable locus of what could be called a dharma. No observable locus means where is the roll of toilet paper? <laughs> we've, we've ruled out that it's out here, so where is it? That's the space-like nature of phenomena. And so one last point of profundity about the text. I really liked the, uh, this translation from the Tibetan, which was the main one I was reading tonight, because I really liked the way they put this. The Chinese doesn't quite have the same oomph. So Manjushri says that Bodhi, awakening, it's just like space. And space, by the way, is just like awakening. Space and awakening are not two. They cannot be differentiated. Whoever, whoever understands this, this sameness knows no small thing. In fact, there is nothing such a person does not know. So here's the thing about it. So let me just try to go full circle on my uh, kind of Dharma talk on non-duality here. 
So the idea of the equality in that sense of space and awakening, that they are not two, they're undifferentiated. That sounds like non-dual speak to me, <laughs> literally, where they're saying they're not two, they're undifferentiated. But this isn't talking about, you know, like this and that are not two. This is about space and awakening. Like my point is Manjushri brought this all the way to the level of space, which is like, again, nothing in that sense and awakening said those two are not different they're undifferentiated and then whoever one who understands that right whoever understands that sameness understands no small thing but indeed there's nothing such a person doesn't know and what I the last remark that I'd want to throw out to you just to think about, just to kind of leave you with in that way is this level of non-duality that we're talking about here, the kind of the light bulb that should go off is, oh, of course, of course, one would know everything. How could it be otherwise? Now the idea is that we can't just talk about non-duality as oneness. <laughs> that way, it's from a Buddhist point of view, it's going to be a lot uh, heavier than that. So um, any last questions, comments, answers, ideas, epiphanies, realizations? Awesome, awesome. Well, the fun will continue next week. Uh, we're still kind of in the midst of all of this, so stay tuned for that. Uh, otherwise, that's it for me. Thanks so much, Michael. That was awesome. Yay. Um, I, want, I wanted to let folks know that, um, so I put into the link um, not only a link to the uh, Manjushri Sutra that we're, we've been talking about, but also to the Vimala Kirti Sutra. Oh, cool. And then also there's, if you go to the um, Dharma door or the um, uh, SF Dharma Collective's YouTube site, there's also a whole series on the Vimala Kirti Sutra that uh, Michael did with Michael Taft. It's really awesome. There's, you know, Michael uh, MC would do like a, you know, a talk like he's doing now on part of the sutra. And then there would be at another session, um, an actual sit le led by Michael Taft about whatever the topic was that um, Michael Owens covered. So it's really awesome. So in there, and I don't know which, I'll, I'll go back and see if I can figure out which one is on the chapter nine, which is the one that the, the chapter you mentioned today. So it's an awesome sutra. Um, Michael, any announcements before I talk about announcements? Other announcements. Um, really quickly, just one. Um, I am doing uh, my own eight week course on the Vajra Sutra, on that famous Mahayana Sutra. That starts next month, July 9th through August 27th. And Tanya put the link to my website um, in the chat. And so you can find out about that. It's on Saturday mornings at nine o'clock to 10 15. Um, yeah, and it's a line by line study of the whole sutra. Um, so if it's something you're interested in, it would be a great way to learn about it. So thanks, Definitely. Tanya.